let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a terrific guest uh, with a great subject, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Now, this week, we bring together two great, huge topics, and we do so in the person of a great scholar. For years now, we've been taking a look at information literacy in the Future Trends Forum and digital literacy. What does it mean to be a savvy, critical, and productive consumer and user of digital content and information in the modern age? At the same time, more recently, we've been looking into what does it mean to do this in an ecological framework, specifically during the climate emergency. Now, Professor Antonio Lopez, an associate professor of communications and media studies at John Cabot University in Rome, has brought these two together into what he calls eco-media literacy. This is a new project, a new way of seeing the world, and he is the inventor and the world's expert. So I'm going to bring him up on stage so he can explain what this is, how we can engage with it, and best of all, so he can answer all of your questions. So without any further ado, welcome Professor Lopez. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, it's really great to see you. appreciate the invitation. Oh, it's a real pleasure. Where have we found you today? Well, I'm in my office in Rome. Luckily, you probably cannot hear the helicopter that's hovering over my building because today we have a new president and they shot off 21 cannons um, below this hill where every day they shoot off a cannon at noon. But today yeah. there was 21 in, in honor of the new president. So it's been quite noisy. But I think it's finally gotten quiet. Well, if, so if we hear any gunfire or uh, artillery yeah. play, or how, we, we'll, we'll know. It's just yeah. ordinary life in the great city. <laughs> That's correct. Well, uh, Professor Lopez, we like to introduce people on this program by asking them to look ahead to the next year and describe what they're going to be working on. So please tell us, what are what are the projects and what are the ideas that are going to be uppermost in your mind for the rest of 2022? Well, that's an excellent question. And um, I have some very interesting projects on the horizon. Uh, one is that I'm very um, pleased to be a part of a collaboration with several other editors to put a get together a book for Routledge, uh, a handbook of eco media studies Ah. which we'll get more into in a little bit, but Ecomedia Studies is uh, an emerging field that sort of combines different fields like uh, environmental humanities and media studies um, and post-colonial studies and so forth. So oh. this collection will be the first. Well, there's, there is a book called Ecomedia, which is a great collection, and one of the editors of that book is my co-editor, uh, Stephen Russ. Nice. But uh, this book, uh, we're in the process of assembling. We have great chapters. I'm in the middle of editing it, so that's taking a lot of work. And then um, in the fall, I plan on teaching a class called Eco Cinema, which is one of my favorite courses to teach. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm super excited because uh, there's this new scholarship coming out of Africa that's connecting many of the issues of ecological degradation in Africa with uh, with um, media studies huh. and we're gonna, one of the films we're gonna screen is Black Panther and talk about how that mm -hmm. connects to ecology. I'm sure mm -hmm. many of you, yeah. and many of you here saw that. Yeah. And I've also um, proposed, uh, this is not like earth shattering, but I'm working on trying to create a minor in environmental studies at my university. And uh -huh. one of the interesting challenges of that is like, what department do you put it in? Which this will kind of come up in terms of the yeah. siloing of knowledge and you know, where, where does it live in the sciences, in the humanities, in the social science. So these are sort of mm. major things that I'm working on, aside from normal writing and blogging and all that. <laughs> all of that. All <laughs> of that. When, does, uh, when does the uh, new Rutledge collection, when is that scheduled in? Okay. Well, the, the manuscript is due in October, so it'll be in 2023. Okay. I'm, I'm so excited. I wish it could come out sooner. Oh, and the most important project that I should mention is the ecomediateliteracy.org website, which there's a link to here. Yes. And I'm in the process of raising money. I don't know if I know that uh, Amical is an organization that you have done some work with. And I don't know if any members of Amical are in this meeting, but Amical has given me a small grant to sort of start developing this. I'm looking for more. But the idea of ecomedialiteracy.org is to have an online resource for teachers. Uh, mm -hmm. It could be an information literacy or, I mean, business. It could be anything. But I'm focused mm -hmm. mo mostly on people who teach media and digital media that they don't really, they, they're interested in the environment and they want to bring it into their classes, but they don't necessarily know how. And this website would, you could go there and there could be lessons for you. There are me, media examples, 
links and so forth also to help do for students to do research because I part of this grew out of the, what I was doing at my library at the university which is we didn't really have a centralized location for student research on media and the environment so I started creating this resource at the library and I split it off and started trying to create an international website that anyone can use for free the open okay. access and so if anyone was, is interested in contributing and collaborating you know please yeah. by all means get in touch we have a, a link to that. Uh, it should be on the bottom left of your screen, a kind of uh, mustard-colored button, and you can click on that and learn a great deal. And uh, it's as a you can beta tell, just a warning, it's a beta version, but you know, it'll by the end of the year, it'll look really nice. But hey, it's in WordPress, so you can do whatever you want. <laughs> with it, right? That's right. So please uh, pounce on that, friends, and uh, give our give our guest feedback and, uh, and, and use it as you can. Um, well, this, it sounds like a very, very busy year for you, and uh, I'm, I'm going to resist the temptation to recommend movies for your class this fall, and instead <laughs> ask you, uh, could you, just to begin with, for everybody who's here, can you give us a quick definition of what eco-media literacy is? Yeah, so um, people often ask this question because it's a sort of a new concept, a new term. I think I, I coined the term eco-media literacy, but I did not coin the term eco-media Mm -hmm. uh, Sean Kubit, who's a great scholar, wrote a book called Ecomedia in 2004. And I'd mentioned in the introduction that there's an emerging field that it's, it combines some different trends that are happening in academia that many of you probably are familiar with. So for one, there's this uh, turn in the materiality uh, in philosophy and media studies, people focusing more on the material conditions and material aspects of media, so how, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. sort of the physical characteristics and the you know the minerals and all the things that go into making that so when you say eco media the eco is is part of that sort of ecological turn is the recognition that media um, are not separate from the environment are there are they are from the environment but also about the environment so we, I, I, I think of it as two sides of the same coin so on the one hand we have to talk about it in terms of its material characteristics and then the whole system of extraction um, and disposal that happens along the commodities chain, but then mm -hmm. the discourses and the beliefs and the ideologies that circulate in global media, um, you know, through websites, popular culture, and so forth. So that that's mm -hmm. how we think about eco media. But then um, eco media literacy is essentially taking that perspective, that critical framework, and then applying it uh, to the teaching of media and my background is in media literacy that's where i come out of so this whole framework actually evolved out of a certain frustration i was experiencing where i've been in media literacy for almost 22 years now when i first started there was very little about the environment and i also did a lot of work in native american communities and uh in the early 2000s and i just felt like there was a disconnection between what i was doing in these communities and what the media literacy movement was doing so um, in my PhD work, which you're very familiar with because you were on my PhD committee, I have disclo full disclosure, <clears throat> I developed this as a response to that. And I, part of that was I try to understand why is there no discussion about these issues or very little. I mean, I, I don't say it was zero. It was, little, it was here in bits and pieces. I try to understand what the barriers and opportunities are in the field of media literacy education. And I think part of it was this sort of historical belief or uh, um, something we inherited in the sort of, I think, the I would say the ideology of modernity, mm -hmm. this idea that um, ideas are sort of belong to the ethers, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. thing, and the media belongs to the realm of, of thoughts. And, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, we're also a very visual culture. So we focus on, on visual mm -hmm. characteristics and ideas and textual mm -hmm. analysis. And we never think about the, the physicality of, of the, or the materiality of the media. You no, know, even with books, we don't think about, you know, how are books made or photography yeah. or any of these things. Yeah. So um, that bias, I think, in, in the Western philosophical tradition and in academia was one of the reasons why it had a strong, that had a strong influence on media literacy education. So people didn't really think about that. Well, that's that's a, a huge synthesis, um, and and so I mean you're you're bringing together the materiality of media, uh, which makes me think of the history of the book, for example. Uh, you're bringing together ecological criticism, um, so mm -hmm. thinking about the role of all of this, but then through literacy, uh, you you make this general, so that uh, I'm I'm if if I'm right by by phrasing this in terms of literacy. In terms
terms of skills and attitudes, that means that everybody uh, can conceivably approach media through this lens. We could think about a printed book, or we could think about a computer game, or we could think about um, a print magazine that we get, or a Netflix show, and start thinking about how well, it's environmental impact, it's participation in the in the participation in the, in the, in the entire world. Yeah, so the, um, the the traditional literacies apply. There's something weird going with the audio. Can you can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Okay, there was a I got an echo and then everything kind of went weird like the matrix, you know, I had a glitch. Okay, everything's normal again. It was an update. <laughs> It was your cat, and I had a, you know. You saw that. You saw cat. that. I saw the cat, so we must be in the matrix, right? Okay. Uh, inside joke for those of you who follow the film series. Anyways, um, uh, yeah. So, what, one of the things I talk about in my book, I, I, I have a book out now called Eco Media Literacy, which is sort of the most updated thinking. Although I'm even moving past that at this point, because I wrote it last year. Um, is that it doesn't take much to to tweak what we're already doing it's just expanding just a, a little to go a little bit more and also to sort of bring in some of the, the the fields that sometimes are separate so for example uh, i'm very much interested in media ecology although mm -hmm. i think that's a big misnomer but you know that's the mm -hmm. the field of study that's interested in medium characteristics and media properties but even media ecology doesn't talk about the materiality in the sense of how how is this made and what is the actual ecological impact of the infrastructure of our entire media system? So just to run it down, because I think a lot of people are, are don't even, I'll tell you a little story and then I'll explain it. I'll give the overview. In 2011, I went to London to uh, a media education conference and I gave a, a presentation on eco media literacy and only two people came to it. Next door, there was a something on Facebook, which Facebook at that time was sort of, you know, the yeah. new phenomena. Yeah. And there was like 150 people there. So, yeah. you know, and people were like, well, what is it? What's and people really genuinely do not understand the environmental relationship between media. But it's so ingrained. I mean, it's so interrelated that we uh, you'd be surprised. So I'll just give you a rundown two minutes and then we'll continue the discussion. You have the, 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 the mining and extraction of minerals. Mm -hmm. and uh, resources for energy, so oil, coltan, gold, mm -hmm. um, and so forth. You know, we, we need these rare earth minerals that our phones use, mostly mined in places like the Congo, which produce uh, horrible environmental devastation and also wars and, you know, very unjust situation. I think everyone here knows about conflict minerals. Um, and then they're produced in very toxic conditions in countries and assembled in places like China. The materials are also shipped all over the world. Yeah. Um, and then e-waste, which is, in, uh, you know, only 13 percent of our devices get recycled, but they're not even really recycled. And if I don't know if anyone's even seen pictures of these recycling sites, you know, you have people burning, you know, uh, cables over fires and breathing all the smoke just to get the, the copper or melt, melting circuit boards to get the precious metals, breathing all this horrible smoke, you know, people in horrible conditions. And then but I think the biggest impact is also our server farms and the fact that you know the 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 the, the mass the, the massive network of servers all over the world requires primarily fossil fuels and currently the you know the the, the so-called cloud emits as much co2 as the aviation industry and that's going to double and mm -hmm. then now we're doing ai bitcoin cryptocurrency mm -hmm. nfts and all and and all those burn servers. I mean, you just have to run, oh, you know, they're, they're using so much power and that's just going to just, you know, juice up the demand. So those are sort of like the major impacts and also electromagnetic frequency. We don't talk about that, but that's an, a form of radiation that impacts wildlife and humans. And, you know, that's a little bit more controversial, but you know, in any case, that's one of the impacts. Well, that's a that's a really good sketch that um, um, that one story, just thinking about digital media uh, and tracing that out. Uh, this is the kind of tracing that people with who are thinking in terms of e-media literacy can uh, really dive into. I, I have one more question for you, um, and then I, I want to turn this over to uh, the entire group here. The the question is, what does this mean for uh, post-secondary education, the world of colleges and universities? Should we consider teaching e-media literacy in our uh, in general education requirements, or do you foresee departments that specialize in this, or does this belong to libraries? Well, what's our role? 
Well, I, I think, first of all, there's a very important role because, you know, I teach these classes in a secondary environment. And this is, you know, one of the places where you can really concentrate on the subject. But I think, you know, librarians, of course, can, uh, well, hopefully my website will be helpful for librarians because I'm working with libraries to do this. Um, but, you know, my sense is I, I, I actually would not want to see something called ecomedia departments created necessarily because in the same way that I don't like to be called an environmentalist, I'm a human being and I care about mm. the environment. Mm. I don't like this being divided off like, Environmentalists are this sort of group of people and everyone else, we're all environmentalists. We may not be very, may not have a very positive or constructive relationship with the environment, but we have, we do engage the environment. You know, what I would like to see is people who teach digital literacy or digital, in digital media or whatever, incorporate mm -hmm. into their normal curriculum modules or, or just expand it to whenever we say, you know, I'm going to be a, a litter on how, how to use this device. Well, I also, Students should know how is it made and what, what are the impacts and also to promote digital citizenship or I'm sorry, eco citizenship mm. because, um, you know, a lot of another complaint I would say I, I have about media literacy in general. And this is also a big issue with uh, education is this thing of uh, I'm sure people have heard the phrase responsibilization, you know, sort of this mm. neoliberal point of view that it's all the individual users responsibility. Right. So like in the case of fake news, it's my responsibility to decide what's real. It's not the responsibility of the platforms to be, you know, to, to exercise some sort of responsibility or editorial control. And so likewise, these, these industries really need to be regulated. And so we need to teach people how the politically, I, 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 I have a whole aspect of my, edu of my pedagogy devoted to political ecology because we have to understand what is the economic system that produces these conditions and how, what can we do to change it? So people have to understand, you know, the, 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 the materiality, but also the political ecology and how does this system construct it? And, and why does Apple make its computers this way? And mm -hmm. what can we do to get them to stop doing conflict minerals and so forth? So there's a whole political economy to this. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can, I can see. Well, thank you for that answer. I can see academia engaging in, in several ways. Uh, friends, let me stop uh, talking and interrogating our poor Professor Lopez, <laughs> and let me ask you to do the interrogating. Uh, so if you're new to the forum, just go to the, the white strip at the bottom of the screen and either click the raised hand if you want to join us on stage, or click the question mark uh, for a Q&A. And already we have one from our uh, Quebecois colleague, Mathieu Plard, uh, who asks, considering that there is a secondhand market for physical media, books, CDs, mm -hmm. and vinyl, how can we encourage the process for digital devices? Well, um, the problem with that is the uh, design principle of built-in obsolescence. So, you know, I think all of us have a drawer full of old gadgets. I have probably five MacBooks sitting in my office that I don't know what to do with because they're not made to be upgradable. So um, I, I fully agree that we should have that. I mean, I have a Fairphone. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Fairphone. But yeah. it's like Lego. It's like Legos. You can, They send you a screwdriver. You can unscrew it. You can replace parts. Yeah. Um, and... There are um, some companies now are, that are building uh, repairable computers and laptops. I, uh, I can't remember the name. There's a company in the U.S. that makes now laptops that you can repair and upgrade. So there, there, there has to be, um, you know, the, the, an effort on the part of the tech companies to not just, like, make everything obsolete every six months. Because, you know, I mean, if you want to be, like, a full-on geek and, and sort of recreate an old, you know, um, Commodore 64, you know, great, you know, that's fine, but not all of us have the time to do that and, and can tinker and do all that, those kind of things. So they have to make it easier for us to be able to fix and repair things. So that I think that would be a very important step. Well, that's great. Um, so uh, again, uh, Mathieu, thank you for the, for the, for the good question. And uh, uh, Professor Lopez, how much does the uh, Fairphone cost these days? Uh, there's different models, I think, like, the, I have the Fairphone. I think this is the four. Yeah. It costs about 400 euros. But mm, um, okay. when I, I, this is my second one. When I returned my old one, they gave me 40 euros credit. They also sent me a return label so that I could just put it in a box and send it to the post office to um, the Netherlands where they recycled everything. And they even took all my other old phones. And, you know, it's quite wow. really nice. 
Oh, that's terrific. Thank you. I remember yeah. when this launched and I was really intrigued by it and uh, I've, I've, I've lost track, but, uh, but this sounds, uh, this sounds really, really good. Um, also, one, one, one other thing I would add is that you know, there is a push. There's a couple of things that governments could do. One is that they, should, they could force tech companies to make a three-year guarantee on their products. Um, and another one is they could do this thing like a take-back program so that they're forced to take back their e-waste. And if they did that, they would be more responsible to, like, if, so if something, I think there's even a law in Italy. So if, if it's actually made in Italy, they have to take it back. And they have to process it and do something like that. So that you know, there there should be laws um, instituted that force the industry to behave like this. Because otherwise, I don't know if they will. Uh, in the chat, uh, people have chimed in. Uh, Roxanne shared the homepage for it. Uh, Matteo seconds the right to repair movement. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't want that to happen. Um, and um, John Zinn points out that uh, he's stuck with a 3G technology in his uh, uh, almost decade-old car, and there's no way to upgrade it. Um, but it should be a simple chip replacement. But basically, he has exactly. to buy a new car for it. Yeah, um, exactly. Well, uh, let me uh, let me just again throw this uh, throw the floor open uh, for more questions and comments. You've you've clearly struck a nerve with our with our community. Mm -hmm. uh, here's one that comes from Charles Findlay at uh, Northeastern University, who come a question that goes right to my heart here. Um, he asks, uh, what is the balance for us here in the forum? Do we shut down the forum or continue the discussion about the impact on the environment? Well, that's a great question, and people often ask this. And my sense is that we, we have to use what's available. So we have to take advantage of the fact that we can connect. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think if we just um, – let, let me bring up the issue of Ludditism because there's sort of a misunderstanding. I'm sure everyone's heard the term Luddite uh, or Neo-Luddite. And, you know, quite often when you crit criticize technology, uh, one, of the, one of the flack or the feedback you can get people like, oh, you're just a Luddite. You want to go back to, you know, primitive times. And I think people misunderstand what the Luddites were. They were not anti-technology. What they were against was their lives being taken over and destroyed by technology. You know, so if I think we have to use what we have to, to improve our lives and to improve what we're doing um, and, and to also, you know, to push back as much as possible. And I think we just have to take advantage of the fact that we're able to meet and to discuss this and try to find a way and try to find solutions. If we all just abandon these technologies, we wouldn't be able to do that. So I think we're, we have better chance of changing things if we leverage what has already been produced. Hmm. than to just reject it all outright. Uh, that's a very practical attitude. Um, mm -hmm. Charles, thank you for the question, which um, was lurking in my own heart. Um, and thank you for that very practical, uh, pragmatic response, uh, Professor Lopez. We have mm -hmm. um, uh, in the in the chat, uh, Jordan uh, Davis, a student of mine, mentions that uh, we discussed uh, the Luddite movement in uh, our class this fall. In fact, we played a role-playing game uh, on the Luddite Rebellion in Manchester, uh, and Jordan was a terrific player. Uh, so, but uh, the, let me uh, invite everybody else to uh, to pose but more actually, questions. Can, can I just say one thing Please. Um, Please. about role playing? Uh, you know, yes. so one of the one of the areas, one of the sort of places that I'm bridging into is education for sustainability, which doesn't do much on media. So one, of, I'm kind of in this weird netherworld because the, the environmental education people don't talk about media, and the media education people don't talk about the environment. Ah. But um, you know, a lot of environmental education people uh, value role playing and games as a very valuable tool to teach. And I have a colleague, she's a media literacy educator, uh, Teresa Redmond. I don't know if she's here, probably not, but um, she does a, a role play in her class where the students have to negotiate, like, uh, they have to imagine what a fair production system would look like and then role play mm -hmm. how, how, that, how to put that into existence. That. That is very, very constructive. I would, mm -hmm. I would love to see that. If you can, if you can share any information about that, I would love to see that. Sure. Yeah, I don't have the lessons, but I would. That would be something I would put on my website, on the EcoMedia Literacy website. Uh, you said that was Teresa Redmond. Yeah. Uh, in the chat, uh, Joyce Ogburn says she knows uh, Teresa Redmond at Appalachian State University. Yeah, that's her. That's her. Yep. Joyce, you have to introduce us. Um, that would be cool. <laughs> Joyce is a, is a marvelous person, a, a scholar Hi, and Joyce. a librarian um, at uh, recently at uh, Appalachian State. Mm, uh, great, yeah. Um, 
And so we have a couple of, of raised hands. Let me just bring people up. And speaking of which, uh, let me see if Joyce is up. Joyce, we need your camera on. Can we? Can you? Uh, can you activate that, or are you only on audio? I'm trying to activate it. Hang on. Okay. okay. <laughs> I have a, it looks like Shindig's changed a little since the last time I was here. Um, oh, you- you can just I'll, just talk, I'll just talk to you. Yeah, um, um, I used to work at App State, and Teresa and I have done some projects together. I was a library dean and other things there, and she she's a very creative educator and very inquisitive about all of these areas. Um, and so, yeah, Ryan, I'll definitely try to introduce you and um, might be a good forum guest to talk about whatever yeah. is going on and um, in, in the education area in, to supplement what uh, Antonio has been talking about, which has been marvelous. Thank you. Yeah, and just thank you. And Teresa is a very arts-based media educator, so she does journaling, a lot of really interesting mm-hmm. stuff. She'd be a good guest. And she and I uh, co-present quite a bit and co-author articles. So, yeah, she's very fluent, fluent in this uh, the material that we're talking about today. Oh, very nice. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you very much. Uh, if you're uh, if you're new to the forum, by the way, those are examples of both the text question and the video question, um, and so you you can just use either of those to uh, to share your thoughts. Um, in fact, uh, Plumman uh, Mittenoff has a, a comment with the raging layoffs of faculty humanities disciplines um, at his campus, the Department of Faculty. I'm curious how STEM faculty can be convinced to introduce such ideas as eco media literacy in their curricula. If the humanities in general have been shunned, so and a lot of this does feel humanities oriented with a bit of the social sciences. Uh, what's the what's the role of STEM faculty in STEM departments? Well, um, I think there's an important role, and if you explore a bit about environmental humanities, they're mm-hmm. um, very much in collaboration with STEM, and um, I, I think that you know uh, I, I have a class I'm teaching now called Media and the Environment, and today I was doing an introduction to eco-criticism. And eco-criticism has sort of three legs, if you could say. Uh, one mm-hmm. is sort of the, the, criti- criti- the critique of, of rhetoric that comes out of literature studies and, and, and humanities. Um, and then the other leg is science, you know, that you have, you're based in a scientific analysis and understanding of environmental systems. And the third one is political activism. That, uh, it's sort of a starting point that, um, it's, it's, you're not neutral. So this is not a neutral field to be in. Uh, for example, environmental communication is, is a field that sort of came out of science communication uh, in the, mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. early aughts where mm-hmm. scientists were trying to like, science are not, as you probably know, not the most best communicators about like trying to talk to the general public about their particular field. So environmental communication sort of combines elements of media studies, journalism studies, science communication now it's a full-blown field unto itself yeah. and um and so they're they're very much sort of kind of in that bridge but they they also self-identify as what they call themselves a crisis discipline you know they, they the starting mm-hmm. point is that this yeah. is a crisis and yeah. we are we are designing our research and our curriculum to solve these these problems but you know i i think it is a, a challenge what is happening institutionally in terms of how universities are sort of changing their curriculum. But I, I think, you know, I, I don't, inter- my university doesn't really have a STEM program. So I don't interact so much with people, at least in my, in my area. But I think that there's a hunger to, to collaborate because um, one of the things that environmental humanities talks about is how important it is for science to be communicated and to be um, expressed through sort of creative means. And I think one way maybe to bridge these topics is like the, the um, digital humanities can yeah. can be very much. There, I think there could be an environmental digital humanities, mm. where you're sort of taking these tools of digital humanities, but also you know translating data, translating information into graphics, into you know, mm-hmm. uh, ways of understanding the world, and so that I think that that, that is something that we could look forward to. Oh, terrific. Um... And uh, are very, very good. I, you bring together so much, so many different strands of, of thinking. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very impressed by this. Uh, we have another uh, video question that's coming up from our long-term uh, wonderful friend, Roxanne Riskin. Let's bring Roxanne up on stage. 
And in fact, uh, in honor of Roxanne, I'm going to I'm going to give us the dramatic close-up display. Check this. Out. <laughs> Hello, I am so happy to be here, Brian. I'm so happy to see you. Yeah, it's um, great to see you. Thank you for taking my question, Antonio. It has to do with um, instructional designers and learning experience designers who are pretty um, adept at using media and technology tools and. What is the implication for us as designers on how we pick certain technologies to use? Because right now we're on Zoom, which is consuming bandwidth, and we mm -hmm. with our microphones, we have these physical devices that, that may have um, come from countries, um, China, Africa, and things that mine these very important resources in a very unethical and very inhumane way. and. I also want to compliment that you used mindfulness and used a Buddhist reference in one of your webinars because I'm a mindfulness mm -hmm. educator and I thought that mm -hmm. was really powerful and it really impacted me to continue to um, use these things. You mentioned that you used it as an example in K through 12 education. You held up a piece of paper and one of mm -hmm. your examples, I remember that mm -hmm. one was excellent. And mm -hmm. also, can you talk um, briefly about the lithium ion, uh, the lithium ion farms that we have exploding all over the world, and and our the intention that we should have to bring um, our awareness to what's happening with these self-driving cars and the newer technologies. Um, you mentioned Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and things like that, but can you talk a little bit about those car, um, the ion car, the um, cars, and how we can how I think there's a new type of technology right now being developed to replace that lithium ion. Mm -hmm. You mean the batteries? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I think there was three questions here. Um, <laughs> the first one, the first one I think is uh, actually easy to resolve. Um, you mentioned like uh, the paper exercise that I do, which is, you know, the uh, from Buddhism, which is like the, the, the teacher would ask, do you see the clouds in the paper? And usually people will say, well, clouds are white, the paper's white. So, but the answer is that the paper is organic matter and the paper is part of the clouds because the clouds produce the rain, which grows with the plants or the trees that make the paper. And then I do that with the phone. I say, you know, do you see the clouds in the phone? So I, I think that you, you know, with your instructional technologies, deconstruct the technology you're teaching with. You know, use that as the tool and have the students like, well, where, how are we able to have this conversation physics? Like, what's the, what is the materiality? What are the systems that are enable us to have this? Another question you can ask, because uh, I'm now, I've been focusing more lately in my interest in understanding the history of energy. By the way, there's an energy humanities, which is fascinating, which is about the cultural aspects of energy and uh, energy development. And, you know, we live in a fossil fuel culture. And I, I asked the students, name everything in this room that uh, was made possible because of fossil fuels, you know, and just like go through that. So, so there's that. Now, the second, the thing about mindfulness. So, in I, I use this circular diagram, <clears throat> where so the kind of analysis I do is of media, what I call media objects, and there's the cultural aspects, there's the political ecology, there's the eco materiality, and then there's the life world. The life world is the physiological impact of our devices on us. And we, we, we are an environment, our brain, our cognition is part of an environment, so we have to be aware of that. And so I explore that in different ways. One is the fact that all media starts as nerve stimulus. Sound and light are physical, they touch us. Our, 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 our brains are responding to actually being stimulated and that these things stimulate us and they get us addicted, they're designed by I think everyone here probably knows this, that, you know, people who design slot machines design these phones and they use the same techniques to keep us addicted and to stimulate our endorphins and all that. That's why we keep checking our phones. And so mindfulness is an important tool to, um, to be aware of how, you know, of our addiction, but also our cognitive responses to things to be also environmental educators are very concerned about our sense of place and space and to think about, you know, how much do our devices remove us from our local environment and how can we bring the local environment back into um, our awareness? And then the last issue about lithium, 
is that, yeah, we can't have a clean economy and replace the current economy with a clean economy and still practice neocolonialism. I mean, we, you know, the, the, the lithium that they need for all these, it's a massive uh, extraction haul that they're going to have to do. Uh, a lot of these minerals are coming out of uh, the Andes and Chile and Argentina and Bolivia. Uh, horrible, uh, you know, working conditions. There was a coup in Bolivia a few years ago that everyone pretty much agrees was because of the, the Peruvians wanted to, I mean, the Bolivians wanted to take control of their lithium. Uh, even Elon Musk said, we'll coup where we want in Twitter, you know, which is kind of a weird cell phone. I don't know why he would like to admit that, but I'm not saying there's a conspiracy. Elon Musk engineered a coup in Bolivia, but the interest, you know, like putting in right wing military dictatorships in countries where the resources they need for these devices um, is convenient. And if those of you saw Don't Look Up, you might recall that they divert. I'm sorry, spoiler alert, plug your ears for a second. They want to divert the comet from destroying the Earth. And so instead of diverting it, they want to break it up so they can extract some minerals from it for, for their devices. And there's a sort of evil character who's kind of a hybrid of Bezos and Elon Musk. And, you know, so it, by the way, there's a name for this. It's called eco-modernism. It's this idea that you can, um, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of an old phrase in, uh, coming out of environmental and ecological thinking, which is you can't solve the problem. You can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created the problem. So a lot of these eco-modernists like Bill Gates, and I, I think this might ruffle some feathers, I don't know, but eco-modernists, um, want to solve the problems that were created by technology with technology. So we have to have a different kind of thinking. We can't just say, replace one colonialism with another colonialism. And so if, if they're inventing new technologies that don't require lithium, I, I, I hear every once in a while, you know, there's water batteries, there's this and that. I'm sure we'll come up with something at some point. But under the current systems, lithium is, is what we use. And so that's going to have a huge impact on the environment. Hopefully, we can find a better way. Excuse me. Um, so when I just want to point out that I'm wearing blue in favor of Tom's blue room. Uh, Ryan, <laughs> this is thank you, thank you. Thank you. Our, this, you participants in the forum that might get that. Sorry mm -hmm. if if I didn't include you in that, but there's one participant that oh has this awesome blue room. <laughs> That's great, Roxanne. Thank you. What a great thank question. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you for your great thank, question. Thank you so much, Antonio. Yeah. Uh, Thank you for that answer. Uh, you're really covering a lot of ground. Um, <laughs> and, and, I have to be an integrative thinker with this kind of material. Well, you really are. I, I've, been, I've been tweeting out the different concepts you've been mentioning so far, and this is really a grand synthesis, which is uh, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very important. Uh, or to put it another way, it's a way in to a lot of these mm -hmm. different issues. Um, yeah. I, I have more questions, but better yet, people in the forum have more questions. So here's one from Jorge at uh, George Washington, at Surrey, at uh, my colleague at uh, Georgetown. Uh, and he says, thank you for introducing Antonio. He synthesizes two of long interests. I would like to ask about a third related space, international and intercultural education in light of his ecomedia perspective. Mm, good question. Yeah, so um, this is difficult to, uh, to simplify, but let me put it this way. Part of the uh, important influence that I had from working in Native American communities and one of the things that helped me understand that, you know, Western thinking um, is, is just one way of seeing the world. And, you know, we in academia and in uh, sort of our intellectual environment have a certain kind of scientific tradition that we are a part of. And there's a lot of new um, material coming out of, uh, in particular, South America about cosmologies that mm. are recognized that, you know, everything is alive. You know, when I worked in Native communities, Native American communities, and I was doing video work, grassroots video work with, with youth, um, you know, the elders would say, don't point the camera at that rock. And I, and that didn't make sense to me as sort of a westernized, you know, individual. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's because the rock is sacred and you can't film it. You can't objectify it with, with media. You have to respect it for what it is because the rock has its own needs and its own perspective. And this is not something that we would accept in our, in our, our reality. But in a Native American uh, cosmology, and I don't want to generalize because all, all Native communities are, are diverse and have different languages, et cetera, et cetera. But um, there's sort of like uh, a, a different worldview in which the, everything is alive, which we don't have in, the, in our Western epistemology. So one of the things that I'm 
exploring a bit more that I'm interested in is the concept of ep epistemological enclosure. The fact that mm. we sort of in our Western scientific tradition have excluded these worldviews. And, you know, Native uh, Indigenous people occupy 80% of the biodiversity on Earth. And it's they're the ones who are going to uh, save us in the sense that they're preserving the knowledge we need to, to survive this uh, environmental crisis. And we have to be open to the cosmology of, of different worldviews. And we can't just say that the Western idea of, you know, like the uh, immaterial uh, instrumental use of the earth is the only way that maybe the earth has, you know, that, that the forest and the animals and everything have uh, our entities that deserve rights and things like that. And I think we have to shift our, our worldview. And as Westerners, it's kind of hard for us to accept that. But I'll, I'll just give one quick example. When I was in graduate school and I started taking some anthropology classes. There was a, um, a pretty famous anthropologist that I took a class from telling a story of how this, he was in Central America and there was this uh, Mayan individual talking about that he'd been, he was talking to a bird and the professor said, and we all know that no one can talk to birds. And I'll say, wait, wait a second. How do you know that? Have you ever tried? Have you ever talked to a bird? You can't say that you can't. And I know lots of people who could talk to animals. So that, that sort of kind of arrogance, like, well, of course you can't talk to, mm. to birds, is sort of a, a rejection and, and, and an example of the sort of epistemological enclosure mm. where he's, mm. he's outright assuming from his worldview that the worldview of that person uh, is not possible. And I think some of you might even know about this idea of the weird. Have you heard of this? Um, this is great. So I, I, I'll share this with you. This is really very much aligned with the intercultural communication Please. piece. Um, so you can look this up. Um, we are not the weird or we are the weird. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, weird stands for Western, industrial, educated, rich, democratic, I think. Yeah. And so there is this, uh, a, psycho a graduate psychology uh student in South America, I'm not sure what country it was, I think it was in uh, Bolivia or Peru. And I guess there's a standard uh, game that they play as part of the psychological evaluation or uh, to do their research. And there's a certain way that people are supposed to respond. I, I, it's a, you know, something along the lines of the prisoner's dilemma. I don't, I don't think it was that exactly, but something like that. And these, this community was just was not doing, responding the way that they were supposed to according to the matrix or the, the, the rubric or whatever. And so he thought, oh, maybe I'm doing it wrong. I'll do it again. And he tried, and the same thing happened. And then he thought, well, maybe it's just this community. So he went to this other community in the area. Same thing happened. And something kind of clicked in his mind. It's like, maybe the experiment is wrong. And mm -hmm. so he and some, and mm -hmm. some other graduate students had this brilliant idea to study, like, they, they looked at the last 20 or 30 years of psychological research, and they want to understand who have been the subjects of this research? And guess what? The, the, the typical subject of a psychological study is a college student at a university in a Western right. world, right. because that's who you have access to. So it turned out like 90 or 90, a very high number of these studies, 90%, the research subjects were, were Western subjects um, and, and, and belonging to universities that, and they were from the Western world. And it's a very skewed, sample even though but that all these psychological theories were based on that and so you know the conclusion was it's like you you study penguins to understand parrots it's like you 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 cannot generalize about other cultures and other societies if all your research subjects are a very narrow sample so i encourage people to read there's a pacific standard has a great article about the sort of overview of the research it's very fascinating um so i've been very interested in that because i experienced that firsthand working in native american communities and also the other thing uh, related to media literacy is that so much media literacy is so individualized. It's about developing individual, like social, I'm sorry, uh, constructionism, you know, the typical uh, the, the, the education philosophy is about the individual constructing their own knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and Native communities, it doesn't work because they don't have their, their communal society. And also a lot of Asian societies are very similar. So, you know, it's like, uh, for example, you've heard the Japanese phrase, you know, the, the nail that sticks up gets hammered down. Mm -hmm. And what I learned from working with Native students, you talk to them and they're listening and they're, they're involved, but you ask a question and no one answers. It's not because they don't know the answer, but 
They don't want to speak the answer because they don't want to embarrass someone else that mm -hmm. might not know the answer. Mm -hmm. That's a different sort of cultural reality. It's, it's, it's communal knowledge. You can't have an individual. No one person can know, know the one thing. Everyone has to know it together. We even have this problem, problem in Italy over cheating because in, yeah. in, in, in Italian students, um, share their the answers to the exams because they think it's their their responsibility as resp as community members if they know the correct answer they should share it with other people and Americans are all based on merit and individualism and so we have this uh, constant conflict in our classes between Italians and Americans because Italian Americans think Italians are cheating and Italians just think they're being generous so yes. <laughs> uh, th there's 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 a, there's a lot there uh uh, Plum and Miltonoff uh, mentions in the chat, on my way to this event, I was listening to a podcast on ants. They don't have brains, but they can do things as a collective that we humans cannot do. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Very interesting, yeah. Uh, have, have you read uh, Amitav Ghosh's new book, uh, The Nutmeg's Curse? No, but I heard an uh, interview with him about it, and it was amazing. But that I think the way that um, he talks about the nutmeg tree is exactly how media, eco-media literacy works. He takes, you know, that, that the nutmeg as, as sort of follows the whole history of that and how it fits into the history of the culture of Indonesia, but also the history of colonialism. And I mean, yes. I haven't read the book. I'm just going off the interview. Um, and that kind of, that's the kind of integrative thinking that we need to do with our, our technologies. Well, that's, that's quite right. And, and he ends with a passionate call for a kind of animism or vitalism uh, that mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. make sure that we give uh, nature and the, the non-human world uh, voices and to listen to it. Does, yeah, does exactly. that mean, is, is eco media literacy a, a decolonizing literacy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, yeah, I have a whole chapter in my book about that, and I, I do I have a very lengthy discussion about the Anthropocene as a colonial concept because mm -hmm. the Anthropocene has comes out of geology, and geology is a, I, I'm oversimplifying. I, I'm not saying all geologists uh, do this, but geology. Is a is a, a child or a, um, a product of colonialism in certain respects because it was the geologists that were evaluating and determining the value of, of minerals for the process of extraction, and you know the whole science was sort of we could say in parallel at least with with colonialism, and then it's geol it's the geologists that came up with the concept of the Anthropocene. And the critique of that, the, the sort of post-colonial or decolonial critique of the Anthropocene is that, that the Anthropocene kind of argues that humans will be humans, that, you know, what's going on to the earth is because humans just, this is what humans do. And people say, no, wait a second, it's, it's a very small percentage of the population that's doing this. Not only that, it's a system that's doing this. And you can't blame everyone for the behavior of a, of a fraction of the population. And in fact, uh, the Eco justice, which is very much concerned with um, like a just transition to future energy, this goes back to the issue of, of lithium, argues that you, um, when you're trying to solve environmental problems, you can't treat everyone the same way. You have to, you know, you have to first of all identify who are the main polluters, who are the main, who are the people that are really causing this problem, and they're the ones who really have to pay for it, and they're the ones that need to like. Uh, uh, to take responsibility. You can't, you know, the people who are getting flooded out in Bangladesh are not the ones who, you know, who, who, are, who are causing the, 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 the rise in the sea. So is that, would that be, uh, I'm thinking of a, of, a, of a learner who is thinking in terms of eco-media literacy. They go to a theater, they see a movie, and they will identify the materiality of it, you know, the projector, um, the literal mm -hmm. film or the digital cassette. Um, you know, they'll think about the construction materials that went into this, but they'll also be thinking about the the small number that are responsible for this. Perhaps the realtor who owns the land and the physical building, perhaps the uh, owners of the studio that made the film. Um, would that be right? That would be part of it. That would be, I would say, half <laughs> of it. And then the other half is what are the ideologies and discourses that are communicated through the film that reinforce yeah. certain belief systems that are uh, sort of part of the problem, so to speak, or part of the solution. I, I, I should emphasize there's a lot of really great media that are helping, and they are part of the solution. You can't solve this without the media. But, you know, uh, that's one thing that I love about the eco-cinema class is that when you study the history of film, the history of film 
in some ways is a propaganda system for fossil fuel culture. If you think of the way that, you know, car culture and technologies of like cr crashes and explosions and all these things that give us excitement and fun um, and, and produce these sort of spectacles of destruction and violence, kind of normalize it and make it okay. Um, and even a film like um, uh, Deepwater Horizon, which is, you know, conceivably about an ecological disaster, mm. is completely focused on the human drama it doesn't really identify, it doesn't talk about or raise the issue of like, why are we drilling out in the middle of, of, of the Gulf of Mexico in the deepest part of the sea? Why do we have thousands of these oil platforms that are leaking all the time that are not, you know, from going back to the 1950s, you know, that that film sort of takes away, it does, you know, it does crit criticize the company a little bit for not paying attention to safety, but it, it doesn't ever really get drilled down to critique the whole system. It's not the job of every media to do that. But it's important for us to recognize also in the, in the discourses, I'll give you another example because I just taught this in my class. I think a lot of you might know the crying Indian ad from the 1970s. Sure. You know, and it, remember this, uh, he's the Indians in the canoe and then he comes out and there's like all these smoke sacks and a car drives by and they throw garbage out the window. And, mm. and then he's, he, he, there's a tear in his eye and it says, people yeah, cause cool. pollution and people can stop pollution. And on the surface, that seems like, wow, that's a powerful environmental message. But in fact, that was produced by the plastics industry to take away the, uh, to, to stop the critique of, of, of industry from the environmentalists and to blame individuals. I say it's the individual's fault for doing that. It's not the industry, it's not the industry that it's is people. doing it. And not only that, then it also sort of uses, is, it reinforces this idea that only Native Americans are ecological and everyone else is not ecological. Right. And I, I want to move away from that. We're all ecological. Uh, um, uh. It happens that you know native, uh, indigenous people are historically more closely associated with ecology, but not there's a lot of indigenous people who destroy the environment as well. So we don't want to stereotype. But I would certainly say that the worldview of most indig indig indigenous people is more conducive and more aware and more sensitive to uh, healing and taking care. I mean, the, the Red Nation, I don't know if anyone here has heard of the Red Deal. I know we're almost out of time, but I'll yeah. try to be fast here. Um, right. The Red Deal is a critique of the Green New Deal from a Native point, of, Native American point of view. And it's, it's sort of a, kind of a, a radical critique. It's quite good. It's a short book. I recommend it. Huh. And they, they, what, they, what they talk about is that we have, and this goes back to eco-media literacy. One of the things that comes out of eco-media studies is to think of media as an infrastructure. Don't think of it as just a film or a TV show or a newspaper article, but it's a, an entire infrastructure. So one sort of emerging definition of media is that media are infrastructures of communication, something like that. So they talk about like our, that we use the phrase critical infrastructure quite a bit. You hear it like in, in policy debates, like a build back better bill, things like that. Critical mm -hmm. infrastructure often ha is related to pipelines and you know the sort of things that make our society run. And they say like, well, rather than a, a critical infrastructure, we need an infrastructure of relations. So the, so the critical infrastructure is based on sort of greed and destruction. Like that's the, that's the fundamental ethic of that kind of a system. Whereas a, fun, uh, 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 a infrastructure of relations is based on care and being in a good relation and be, or being a good relative. And being a good relative means being a good relative to the more than human world, to each other, but also to the future intergenerational justice, you know, to future generations, that we leave the place in uh, for the future the way that we, you know, we benefited from it. We have to make sure other people in the future can do that. So it's a different mode of thought. Um, it's it's a, a completely different ethical system that we're not, you know, it's not what we're a part of. We have to transition into that kind of way of thinking. Uh, speaking of transition, um, uh, we're, I, I have time for one quick quick question for you. Uh, and thank you. This is this is a torrent of ideas, and I've, I've been tweeting <laughs> some of these uh, and putting some in the chat. What well, what does a, a given university or college look like if they embrace uh, ecomedia literacy, and and do that for say ten years? How does that campus? Uh, how is it different? Wow. Uh, you know, honestly, I had not put that into. I haven't thought that through. But if I was going to First of all, I would develop, I would change the curriculum so that you're not, um, you're not having all these different silos that mm. everything, uh, you know, that you would have a lot more interdisciplinarity and that the science and the humanities would be more um, uh, 
sort of integrated, I would also have mindfulness, you know, that should be a part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, I I think I would structure the curriculum. I mean, if I think about what I want my students to be able to do, I'm teaching a class right now. I have a bunch of visiting students. By the way, uh, I, I you mentioned someone from Northeastern. We have students from Northeastern that do like we get about 150 of them every, in the fall. Um, nice. We we um, so I have students that are actually environmental studies majors in my class. We don't have it at my university, but they're from their university, and it's great because when I introduce an idea, they're like there, they're on it, they get it. They 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 the environmental studies, as I mentioned at the beginning of, of our presentation, is you know, in the science, it's in the humanities, in the social science. And when, when you have someone that's equally balanced in those, these ideas move much more fluidly. So mm-hmm. these students, like they're my, now they're my research assistants because they get it. You know, they're just on it. They just know it is amazing. It's so great. But the students that are, are just sort of stuck only in the humanities or in the social science, they're, they're, they don't have that integrative thinking. So I would mm-hmm. definitely balance the curriculum much more. Also, I would move away from this paradigm that everything has to be about business and marketing. I just, you know, mm-hmm. that's driving mm-hmm. me nuts. And and to teach more about eco-citizenship and, and to help students. I mean, you know, I think this is a big problem for media literacy. And I'll just leave every, everyone with this. If you work in digital literacy or, eco, or, or media literacy, is to, it's important for individuals to be able to read and deconstruct a text. I'm not denying that skill. You know, information literacy on that level is absolutely important. But we can't just do that. It's not just up to the individual. We have to teach people how these systems work, and we have to teach them to be active eco-citizens to put, so they can change the laws or put pressure on the companies to stop behaving the way that they behave, because they're not going to change unless we, we change them. So I just think that the, the, the literacy that we're lacking is the literacy of the materiality, but also the political literacy of how do you change the system. What a great vision to uh, to conclude on. Uh, Professor Lopez, this is an astonishing work that you're doing. Um, you, you sound like a, a one-person army. Um, a couple of <laughs> I need help. Please help me. Well, I, I, I can't I, do I it think- by myself. I, I always ask guests uh, how we can keep up with you, and uh, I, I think your Ecomedia Literacy website is one way, um, mm-hmm. and uh, we've been tweeting at you, so that might be another mm-hmm. way. That would be nice. I, I'm sure when I go to Twitter, I'll have a bunch of notices. Yeah, oh, I mean, um, I, I post updates on Twitter, um, and I think, you know, at a certain point, uh, when I, I, what, I, what I'm going to need in the coming year is I'm applying for a grant to, uh, I need to program a little module in this WordPress site mm. to create a forum so people can, can create lessons. And what I need people to do is to create lessons and test the system. And then also to, to go to Ecomedia Literacy. And really, I would like you to go with your Zen mind or your child mind, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. and just say like, well, okay, this is what I, I need. There's something I want, and does this website have it? And you go and you can't find it, you, need, you should tell me about the design of it, the wordings, if, you know, if it's confusing. I, the more people who try to find resources and use this, the better it's going gonna, it's gonna to help me. We're sort of in a beta phase. And so, and I haven't even, because I'm waiting to get the, this program, this little module, I haven't really announced anything yet, but I certainly will put it out on Twitter that to please come create a lesson or try a lesson that's been put on there. And, you know, uh, the ACRL framework, I have some librarians that through Amicall that I'm going to work with. I really mm-hmm. want to see, uh, I think you can green ACRL very easily. Just take you know, that framework and, and use it as a subject, as the subject matter eco-media literacy. And just, you know, I would love, I'd love people to start doing that and trying that out. Well, I think let us know when that goes live and, uh, and, mm-hmm. and, and, and we'll be delighted uh, to, to share that. Uh, thank you so much. This has been a, a terrific, you. terrific discussion. And, Wait, uh, let's just quick clarification. Sure. Ecomedia liter- literacy site. You can use it now. You can access it now. It's just not. It's not ready for the for the level that I want it to be at. So it is live. So, but I'll let and, you know when it's really like that tool is available for you to use. And your uh, your uh, Twitter handle is Media Ecology, right? Media Ecology, all one word. I'll just put that M- in the chat. Okay. Um, M e d i o l o g y. It's it's in the chat now. Great. Thank you so much. This has been a real, real pleasure. Good luck with this work, and we'll be in touch sure. to see how it goes and help out. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for everyone's questions. They were fantastic. Well, there. Take care.
But don't okay. leave everybody. I uh, just want to point out where we're headed in the next few minutes or the next few uh, weeks. Uh, first of all, next week is our sixth anniversary. Woo! So be sure to come, uh, bring friends, and we'll have a lot of fun and uh, and celebrate and a lot of thinking. We have other topics coming up, including more on the climate crisis, libraries and careers, minority students on campus, public higher education, and Web3. Uh, if you'd like to keep talking about these issues of decolonialization, the materiality of decolonialization, under, under uh, uh, Ecomedia Literacy, you can throw things at our blog at uh, brianalexander.org, or you could tweet at us at Brian Alexander or at Shindig Events. Just use the hashtag FTTE. Uh, if you'd like to go back into the past, into our archive, and look for some previous sessions that discuss this, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Uh, thank you all for the really thoughtful questions and consideration. This has been a really, really rich discussion. Um, I'm really grateful to be able to think and talk about all these issues with you. Good luck with your work. Uh, this last end of winter if as he will uh, hope to see you next week work hard take care be safe we'll see you online bye bye